Good morning. I want to welcome everyone participating in this morning's webinar. My name is Evgeny Sehenko, and I'm an outsourced accounting and advisory services supervisor at Gelman, Rosenberg, and Friedman, and I will be today's moderator. I'd like to start off today with some quick housekeeping items and explain what participants need to do to earn CPE credits for today's webinar. For the best sound quality, we highly recommend that you connect by phone instead of your computer. If you have any technical questions or issues during the webinar, please use the questions function to speak with a webinar administrator for assistance. Please note that this webinar will be recorded and made available on our website following the event. The slides will also be posted at the address shown, which is www.grfcpa.com slash webinars. Webinar participants seeking CPE credit for this presentation must complete and submit a short evaluation survey that will appear automatically immediately following the webinar. Please write down these CPE words on their, as they will not be provided again. You'll be asked to recall these words in order to receive credit. If you have an active pop-up blocker, please take a moment and disable it now so that it will not block the survey. Any technical questions about the survey may be addressed to Dominic Acosta at dacosta at grfcpa.com. So as the title of today's webinar implies, Today's learning objective is to provide attendees with a better understanding of forecasting DCAA compliant indirect rates. 1.5 CPE credits are made available to attendees of today's webinar. So with all that said, welcome to today's webinar, part two of five, projecting indirect rates for proposals and forward pricing. With that, I'd like to introduce the speakers. First, we have Paul Calabres, who is a principal with Gelman, Rosenberg, and Friedman's Outsourced Accounting and Advisory Services Group. Mr. Calabres brings a successful track record of working with both nonprofits and government contractors. His remarkable career includes positions with the Air Force Audit Agency, DCAA, and three government contractors, in addition to 20-plus years in public accounting. Chris Brown is the president of Aldebaran and has 25 years of experience with the development and promotion of the Syntax software product line. He has personally helped hundreds of government contractors achieve compliance through the use of cost accounting software that is purpose-built for the government contracting industry. With all that, I'd like to turn over the presentation to Paul. All righty. Well, welcome, everybody. And we're glad you're joining us today. Today, we're going to be talking about three business scenarios for projecting indirect rates. And there could be other situations. And we're going to be able to look at some spreadsheets. That's where most of the uh, information is going to be. But we'll go over each one of these three um, things so you get a sense of exactly um, the different business scenarios. The first one will be if you've got a lot of information that's historical. Years ago when I worked for DCA, we learned about fixed and variable cost analysis with the cost pool. And so we'll show you how possibly it is to uh, project an indirect rate for the next year or multiple years using fixed variable analysis. The second business scenario is um, where there perhaps is no historical data and you're like setting up some geographic rates. And so we'll go through that and we'll show you how we built um, the office furnishings. And, and then from there, we went on and developed the two different rates. There's one on-site and one off-site, but we'll go over that in a bit. And the third is you got like less than a full year of historical data, but you have enough information to project for a whole year, and therefore you're going to build a budget from scratch. And from that budget comes an indirect rate. So those are the three scenarios. And uh, Chris, he'll be interjecting, and he's got a lot of information too, because he is he like myself have worked with government contractors over the years. We've worked with different uh, presenters, and we've learned a lot of different things about proposals. Because as you know, you need these indirect rates to do your cost proposals or price proposals. Yes, 
so we're here to talk about the methods of projecting provisional indirect rates. So what does that mean? What exactly does that mean, provisional indirect rates? The word provisional means temporary, interim, not permanent. It is a budget. It is a your best estimate as to what your indirect rates, fringe, overhead, GNA, et cetera, are going to look like during the course of the coming calendar year. And why is that important to project provisional rates? Well, it's also referred to as board pricing. Well, it's for billing purposes when cost reimbursable contracts are in your business mix. Okay. And so with that, we've come to our first polling question, which is, do you feel you have sufficient knowledge to forecast indirect rates? And it's a simple yes or no question. So please take a moment now to answer. And while everybody's recording their answers, I'll provide the first CPE word. The first CPE word for today is indirect, I-N-D-I-R-E-C-T. Remember, if you want to receive CPE credit, please jot these words down because you will need them for the survey following the webinar. Again, the first CPE word is indirect, I-N-D-I-R-E-C-T. Okay, so it looks like um, a fair amount of you um, feel you do have sufficient knowledge to do this and 38% feel that you don't. Um, so good. And maybe for those of you who have this, this knowledge too, you can start to relate to some of these business scenarios. Hopefully, it's, or if you haven't experienced these business scenarios, this will be helpful to you. So the first one we're going to go through is fixed variable analysis. When you deal with uh, fixed variable or anything to do with regression and the slope of a line and an equation of a line, we need at least three years or what we call three plot points on a graph or else it's really hard to do it too because that's kind of a line. So, um, and this particular organization, which really does exist, but we doctored it up, has a high IR&D investment, which is in GNA. They only have a fringe and a GNA rate, or an SGNA rate, and that SGNA rate is sales general and administrative rate. They're just at this point, they don't need an overhead, and they put everything in, and they're working everything through uh, GNA. And as we've shared with you before, every organization, they're not necessarily a right or wrong. It's just what seems to work best for them. They have a direct workforce and a research team of these really highly skilled engineers, but they're part-time, and the officers actually contribute to this as well. Um, they started out in 14 or so at about 2 million, and now they're up to 7 million, but they only grew to about 3 or 4 million, and then all of a sudden they have this blip. So how do we predict that? You know, it's not so easy. So, and, and just like we said, uneven yearly increase in revenue is one of the reasons we might want to use this. Um, the research contracts, two years, are short term. Normally, they're more maybe three, four, or five years in length. Contracts vary. They're only about a million and a half, except for this one large $8 million one. And they're incrementally contracts, incrementally funded contracts with short term. So it really makes it difficult to predict from year to year. Okay. We're now going to, uh, let's see what else we have. Um, so again, as I would remind you, there's a minimum of three years of indirect data. We're gonna identify in the cost pool, that's the numerator over the denominator, what costs are fixed and what are variable. And generally fixed costs don't fluctuate. You know, you got your rent and software license and depreciation, those kinds of things, and they don't, they don't change. And they don't change much, and this is the unique thing for indirects as they relate to the allocation base. Variable costs, they fluctuate from year to year. Fringe cost pool is a very good example because almost all of them fluctuate and are variable to the fringe allocation base, which usually is total productive labor. In other words, as the fringe expense in the cost pool is a dependent variable, the denominator is a independent variable. So the numerator goes up or down as the base goes up or down. 
and the base will fluctuate, obviously, with revenue if you're a labor service organization, as many are in the D.C. metro area. Some of you are outside of the area, but I just share that with you. So any fringe, ba any fringe cost is, tends to be variable. Salaries, bonus will vary from year to year. Local taxes, depending upon how you're doing. Office supplies, postage, shortage. So it is true that you could argue these fringe costs um, and as fixed or variable over time, and we could probably have disagreements. For the sake of this presentation, let's just stick with the, these are what we've presented. Yeah, these assumptions. So basically, uh, again, some of the variable costs that are going to impact fringe, it's going to impact overhead, it's going to impact GNA. Those will be your total salaries or wages and the components thereof, direct labor, overhead labor, um, GNA labor, all of those come into play. And you'll find that from year to year, they're typically going to be var variable as opposed to fixed. Uh, one other thing that comes to mind, is, which, which, which is kind of nice about this uh, present, what we're going to show you today, we're using going back to use some high school algebra to give, create that best guess estimate as to what your rates are going to look like over the course of the year, knowing there's going to be fluctuations. But uh, sometimes they, uh, I've talked to consultants in the industry who say the best practice is to get everybody in a room and sit down and go slog through the general ledger, you know, go through the expense accounts, try to figure out, you know, where things are going to look. Well, research shows that the human brain is not geared to think more than 90 days in advance. We're sitting here in Bethesda, Maryland today on a snowy day. We're not thinking about September, October, when the leaves are changing, and why is that important? Well, that's at the start of the new fiscal year. How many folks on the line today are even thinking about what's going to happen then? So we don't. This kind of takes that whole aspect out of it. Just trying to sit around saying, okay, where, where, where are things going to look in July? You don't know. So by using this fixed variable analysis, this trend analysis, it kind of takes the burden off of trying to figure out on an account by account basis where things are going to stand keeping in to keeping in mind very much that there, there will be the variable expenses and there will be the fixed expenses as well yeah that's a good point point. and what chris is really saying is that what we're really projecting here is if we know the allocation base we're going to project the cost pool correct and it can be done with a trend line for multiple years so you know how dca would issue those flash reports and say well they only have a one or two year rates and they kind of use the same rate as they go out and DCA likes to see it vary. Well, one way to make it vary is your first year could be very detailed. And then as you go into the four or five out years, they're not detailed with just rates. And if you think about it, some organizations say, look, I know my rate's going to be this. It's been that way all the time. But there's just so many unpredictable things, like you say, that happens over a year. I don't know how I'm going to get to it, but I know I will get to it oh, yeah. roughly. Case in point, uh, let's say you're trying to project legal costs. Let's just say there's a, uh, a contract that's going to be up for recompete later in the year. And let's just say you lose it and you want to do a bid protest. Did you think about those legal costs coming into play about a bid protest, which can really spike your GNA rates? Obviously, uh, that there's an un unallowable component to that, but that's neither here nor there. But that's why we do it this way. So That's a good point. Let's move into the... So we start to get into a little bit of um, the uh, algebra, the scary algebra. Yeah. It scares us all. Um, but I would suggest when you start, take a focused look at your historical rates and your cost pool base and the outcome of the rates over years. Now, we're just going to focus with the uh, SGNA rate. Why I can say three years is because we need three years as a minimum plot points on to get a trend line, even a slope of a line, because the slope of the line is the change in Y over the change in X. In fact, the, the formula for fixed variable cost where, um, where of a, for the cost pool where the projected allocation base is known is Y equals MX plus B. But that M piece is the item above here. It's the change in Y over the change in X. And so we'll show you practically how that works. And when we project the cost pool, it'll be comprised of Y variable plus B cost and the regs fixed cost. So, and then we'll look on the trend lines and we'll, we'll see how they work. Sometimes they work, sometimes they don't work. So um, what we're going to do is move into the next slide where um, you can now see an open spreadsheet. So with this open spreadsheet, um, 
and I want to, okay, I wanted to see if it's possible if I can just, no, I can't. I was hoping to kind of get rid of the top tab, but it doesn't matter. Sometimes just the basics is the hardest piece. Now, let's go back up to the top here. This is an entity, like I said, that's high in the SGNA. There is a fringe rate, and there are direct costs. As you can see, there are five uh, years of historical cost. On the right side, as you go down under column N, we have designated whether it be a V for variable or F for fixed costs. And I try for the few fixed costs, because a lot of costs are variable, I try to put them in blue. Um, the reason why we call this an SGNA is that there's a lot of direct selling or sales type of cost on account 8011. But in this sense, it's pretty much variable. So I'm not going to focus on the fringe rate. Fringe rate's pretty straightforward. It's all variable. I want to focus on projecting the SGNA, or for those of you who think in your mind a GNA rate, that's that's perfectly fine. So we're going to focus on accounts uh, starting with the, the SGNA 8005. So the software license in blue is kind of fixed there. Um, security costs would tend to be fixed. Uh, the computer and internet expenses would be somewhat fixed too. These are purchases of, of computers that are under a certain threshold for depreciation. But there are depreciation expense, which is fixed. In some years, they're pretty close. Um, in some years, they're not. Um, and then I believe your accounting is different than legal. Legal is needed on an ad hoc basis, hopefully. Yeah. But accounting, you need year by year. I mean, you can't. And in this organization, they outsource their accounting. So that's why it gets up a little bit. Um, they're too small at this point or don't need to have an audit. Then utilities and rent. Now the rent starts to spike because in the 18-year, um, they have um, two sites, even though it's combined under one. And let me just see if I can do the magic. Yeah, here, freeze. There we go. Now I can go down and we can see some things together and see what year we're in. There we go. Um, so there's some IRD depreciation expense. Um, I might have passed this to make sure I didn't pass. Yeah, some telephone. It tends to be fixed. So there we go. We have all these fixed and variable costs, column N. At the, top, at the bottom, we summarize the cost pools. Over the base, in this scenario, we're expecting the rates to pretty much be, um, the indirect rates to be over 100%. So um, it starts in 14, around 129, 15 is 128, then it takes a, a step up to 138 in 16, goes down a little bit, 135 in 17, goes up a little bit, 137 in 18. So. And you can see all the information again that I recast. Notice the revenue. The revenue increase starts out small, but it's like a hyperbolic curve that goes up. You know, it starts at four, then 26, then 42, and 140. So it's it's really moving up um, in there in the percentages. But notice really up through 17. You know, it's 2.6, 2.7 million, and then all of a sudden it goes to 6.4. 6.5. So that's a big increase because of that $8 million contract. Not all performed in that year, but still significant. And this is the reality of what happens. Now, there are many ways to deal with these algebraic questions, I mean, or issues. And what I did was I just broke them down each part of the equation. Okay, what's Y, what's B, what's Y variable in the pool, what's fixed variable in the pool, what's X which is the allocation base, and then the change in Y over change in X. And then the formula is pretty easy to do. In other words, I do 
the change in y over the change in x to get the m part of y equals mx plus b, and then I can do the whole formula. That way, if you remember in, in uh, good old algebra, sometimes you have to flip the fraction when it goes over on the other side, and if it's a plus, it becomes a minus, and I didn't want to do that. Instead, I'd rather just take a piece of it and show it to you. So what you're seeing here is a historical recount of what is y equals mx plus b uh, for the column um, for what y equals mx plus b, like in this situation, is 545,000. But when we talk about the change in y over the change in x, okay, so y is here, and it's over the change in x. So it was 19,000. And you see the change in the, that's 736 over 716 is 19 um, with change. And then you see the base is 633, over 607, it's uh, 26,000. So the change in Y over the change in X, and we do this for every year. So what's that fraction? Well, the fraction in the first one is 0.7427. So you see, we can't do anything with the first year because basically it's just there for the change in Y over the change in X, just like the increase in revenue. We just, it's just there as a base to start with. And then we see that the, the change in the slope of a line really starts to go up to 1.3, goes down to 1.19, and then it goes back almost up to 1.3 again. And so when you do the, the equation, you can see what um, basically um, is what, what is the valuable, the value of the variable cost in the cost ball. So what I did was with y equals mx plus b, and like with regression and trend lines, when things tend to be going on an upward basis or a downward basis for rates or costs, these things tend to work. When you get a scattergram, of course, that's what re regression is supposed to do. It's a, it's the sum of the, the smaller differences in on a scattergram uh, graph where you just see points everywhere. But you know that you see some, you remember that correlation coefficient, I'm really getting into statistics. Um, isn't always so good at R squared. So what we're trying to do is, and in this example, I'm trying to make the lines kind of go in the same direction to show you because a lot of organizations, they grow, and but they're not sure what that rate's going to be at the end of the year. I did this last year for the PBRs, for the Provisional Billing Rate Review for this entity, and DCA accepted it. So it does work. Either that or they didn't understand it. I know they would understand it. Well, back in the day when you were a young DCA auditor, they taught you this method. That's where you got this from. Yeah. So, uh, uh, that's a very salient point. This is something that the DCAA, if you present it to them, they're going to they're gonna accept your <clears throat> board pricing rates. Exactly. So perhaps they have this. I wish if they did, they would talk about it a little bit more so people could see it. But um, it is a, a way to do it. I would still prefer, as Chris may talk about later, where you get into a lot of the detail and make the first year very, very detailed, the projection, and then use something like this as um, in conjunction with that for your out year rates. But this is just a simple example for you. So basically what I'd like to show you is because these slopes are changing and they really do dictate um, what's going to happen in the equation for uh, a projected line, I took the average of it. And the average of these four is 1.1439. Then I stuck it in the equation. I said, if I knew that the base X is 2.8,2825, and I use this formula, what would, what would the resultant rate be? So in this little cell here, basically what we're saying is H92, which is this average, it's just M change in y over the change in x, which is under y equals mx plus b. So H92, the average for these four years, times K92, which is the projected x, it's the base, okay? So y equals mx, the slope of the line, times x, the allocation base that we know. You're going to have to build some kind of budget and stick it in there. Then plus K84, and K84 is plus B, 
was the last year's fixed cost, unless I know something better. So I could have put in another number, but I used the last year's because fixed supposedly doesn't change year to year to year. So it's a good thought. And when I do that and I solve my Y, my variable cost is 3.5, but my cost pool has to include the fixed cost. So essentially that fixed cost comes back into it, that 334. And this is Y equals plus B, Y plus B, excuse me. And I get a cost pool that has variable and fixed cost. Now, the cost pool is 3.899 divided by a base of 2825, and I come up with a rate of 138.04%, which is, that would be over here, that would be the fifth year. So it is kind of interesting, it is in, within the same range. And it is something, like I said, that you can use. I know that I'm kind of going fast. You're not thinking probably algebra today. You're probably looking at, if you're in a DC area, you're looking at the snow. But what I would share with you is go over the formulas. I don't want you to just focus on the formula. I want you to understand that slope of the line, and I'll show you in a minute some trend lines that Excel does a great job on when you do charts or graphs. It's just to focus on what you can do with it. So if we go below, We can see the SGNA rate. I don't like to project rates with a trend line because it's made up of two components. It's basically made up of the pool and the base. So using this trend line, it would say that the projected rate should be what, 141.5 or two, and we came up with 138.4. They don't always work, but I always play this game just to see. Because when they do, and then I show it to DCA, they can't fight about anything because everything lines up. I'm always trying to think what what the auditors are looking for, what will, I wouldn't say make them happy, but what will suffice. So let's look at the pool. The pool starts at 786,000 and it goes all the way up to 3.6. And I think ours was what we, we suggested it should be. Let's go back. Ah, better go the other way. Okay. So in our projections, just to remember, 2.8 million in the base and about 3.9, 3.9 million in the cost pool when we put the variable in the fix. So 3.9. I don't think this works exactly either, but it is interesting, and I like, again, looking at it. So it looks like, uh, now it's closer to 3.5. So the trend line here would say, if you just took the trend of these five years, it would be really a pool of 3.5 rather than 3.9. But it's because of this spike here that when you do the average of a slope, it kind of puts it up, but when you do regression, what it's trying to do is find the, it's, I guess, the sum of the digits, I forget the old phraseology, to get this, this, this line here. So they don't exactly work. So what I may do is go back and look at my numbers and say, is the regression really giving me the right answer? Is the slope of the line giving me the right answer? But the bottom line is it's going up for the pool. So it's off by about 400, 500,000. Again, just between you and I, it doesn't necessarily mean I would show these graphs to DCA. It's just another way to think through things and make sure that I'm kind of going in the right direction. It's the same with the base. The base was about 2.8, right? 2.8, and it's off by about 300,000. It's about 2.5. So again, it's interesting that both of them are off by a certain amount, a certain amount one by 400,000 or 500,000, one by 300,000, which is five over three. The point is, is that this gives me additional information. You say, Paul, why are you showing me something that doesn't work out perfectly? Because life doesn't really work that way. And if you want a projection that really is solid, um, uh, you know, you would have to go back there and do it. Um, 
I don't have a calculator in front of me, but it would be interesting to take the pull over the base and just see whether or not you come up with the same answer. What do you think, Chris? Well, I think when you're, you know, if you're asking about regression versus uh, the slope of the line, when you're talking about, you know, four hundred, five hundred thousand dollars here, um, it, I guess it doesn't really matter which methodology you use. Certainly, uh, this uh, whole exercise is about using the slope of a line to kind of project your indirect rates, but we came in at 138% and 141 the other. So, uh, you know, we're close enough. Either either one will work. Right. And if I did, I just uh, pulled out a calculator, it would be like, it would even be higher. It would be at 1.66, which I know would not work. No. So... But it, it's nice to have something like these trend lines to kind of oh, look back, mm -hmm. kind of say something to you. Yeah. Um, accounting, sure. they say, is an art. Right. Cost right. accounting is really an art. Projections are even more of an art. Absolutely. So again, this is your best estimate. Your best. You're, you're building a budget. You're trying to determine, you know, under uncertainty, how things That's are going to look over the course of the year. Right. And sometimes I know a lot of people, and I wouldn't be surprised on this call, would say, I have a sense, my business intuition tells me we're going to hit 138 or around that. But I can't tell you exactly, exactly how. You know, I mean, I may have the base, and yes, I have parts of it, but no matter how I build that rate, it doesn't come to the right number, but by the end of the year, it is the right number. And that is very frustrating. So sometimes these, um, budgets that you build from scratch, they sometimes help you and, and guide you. And like you said, it's an estimate. DCA is not asking you that your estimate's perfect or that you come out, but they do like to look at the process of how you came up with it. Exactly. And that's how they evaluate. Exactly. So as long as you can present a nice tabular spreadsheet as such, they're going to be good with it. Right. They know, they know that you're just not throwing a number out there and hoping it works out and wind up at the end of the contract, you know, overspent on your provisional rates, and then you have a, you know, an equitable claim saying, yeah. you know, here's what, what we projected it would be, and here's what it was, so therefore, if there's money left over on that contract, write us a check. Exactly. Okay, so we're going to go back to the PowerPoint. Okay, so up here what you're saying is a recap of what we just provided to you. Um, so what I did was we kind of went, you know, freewheeling through an Excel spreadsheet, but these are copies for you um, so that you can look at this later and say, okay, this is what Paul did. Um, so we don't need to send you the Excel file and you can just actually go through it. This is the first part, the direct and the fringe, as you recall. This is the SGNA pool which is what is fixed and variable, and finally the analysis that we came up with. But I also put in the graphs so that you could see them too, and the trend line is here. Um, and then I have the pool, and I have the base. Again, if you try to project the uh, rate, um, you're, you're dealing with two components that make that rate. You probably won't get a good number for projection on a trend line. But when you do the pool separately and the base separately, you should pretty much wind up with a good number. Great, thanks Paul. So with that, we've reached our second polling question and it's a follow-up to the previous polling question and it is, who's responsible at your company to project your indirect rates? Is it your pricing personnel, your contracts personnel, accounting or finance, technical personnel, or the CEO or the president? Please take a moment now to answer. And while everybody's recording their answers, I'll provide the second CPE word. The second CPE word is finance, F-I-N-A-N-C-E. Remember, if you want to receive CPE credit, please jot these words down because you're going to need them for the survey following the webinar. Again, the second CPE word is finance, F-I-N-A-N-C-E. Okay, so interesting enough, and Chris, you can chime in too, the bulk of this is done through accounting and finance. 
And in a perfect world, we would have had an all of the above uh, option uh, for one of the answers, simply because, uh, in my opinion, when you're building your budget, in addition to your finance and accounting team, you, you need to involve your capture managers, your business developers for your pipeline review. You want to take a look at that. You want to get an idea, you know, what are our, our, our historical win rates? You know, what are our chances of winning these uh, opportunities that present themselves in our pipeline? Uh, you also need to involve your contracts managers. You know, you need to know which contracts are going to be expiring at the end of the year or during the course of the year, uh, which contracts are up for recompete. How do we do as an incumbent? What are our chances of winning those contracts on, uh, on a recompete? You probably need to involve maybe some HR people as well. Uh, you know, you're you recruiting recruiters. You need to know, you know, if we are going to go after this opportunity, are we going to be able to staff this adequately? What are our chances of being able to, you know, uh, attract and retain the type of individual that's going to be able to perform on this contract, whether they need a clearance or not, things of that nature. Uh, you obviously you need to involve your uh, CEO or your executive staff, your C-level folks, just to get a sense of, you know. Bid, no bid. You know, uh, obviously the capture managers want to go out there and try to, you know, b build the business, get as much business as they can, but not, some of the things have to be tempered, some of those opportunities. So I would say that, you know, just from a, you know, uh, an intrinsic standpoint, just I would like to see a, all of the above as far as the responsibilities are concerned for projecting indirect rates because it all plays together. Yes. And interesting enough, when I I had I worked for three government contractors, and the first one I was like a subset of accounting, definitely for a while, and so, but they call me like a cost accountant or something like that. So it was accounting, like most people. Then the other, um, but then they moved me into a department called sales, which was part of operations, and so even though I didn't see any, and then the last two were the same. The contracts people did it, and if they were large enough, they might have separate pricing people under them. So it's interesting how each organization aligns itself with those responsibilities. Yep. Um, but no matter what, when pricing or contracts do it, it wouldn't hurt for them to just run it by accounting, especially as you become larger, because we know cost accounting standards require consistency yes. in estimating, accounting, and reporting. Right, CAS 401. So now we're up to um, what do you do if you have no historical data, you're doing it from scratch, and in this situation, um, developing geographic rates. So we got a contractor located in Florida, and they're at NSA, Maryland, super secret, super careful place to deal with. And basically what they want in this contract in supporting NSA is they want to have some work done on the site in NSA, and then they require a an office facility close by within a mile or two that's outside the base. And so we've got a couple things there. So obviously the organization normally operates with their own in Florida with their own fringe, their own overhead, um, and their own GNA. And the overhead and GNA, like facility costs, are all in the same building, in the same floor. So they're going to develop an on-site government rate and also a local office that's off-site. And we'll see. Obviously, the off-site rate as you'll see, tends to be a little bit higher, but we'll get into that. Things to note. A big deal was the furnishings, the office furnishings of all kinds, furniture, equipment, related to an office. And they needed to know that, and they needed to be a little bit precise because it was going to be on a proposal. So they had done nothing. These, these rates don't exist until the proposal required it to exist. And then they're going to have to develop, of course, uh, an off-site local overhead rate for their office so that the furniture fits into it. And they'll have to devy up what's capitalized, amortize it or depreciate over so many years, and the non-capitalized office furnishings. At the same time, they're going to have to develop 
an on-site government overhead rate, and the key is there better not be any facility costs, and the government's going to scratch its head and say, now you're sitting at my desk, my office, with my electricity. Why would you put facility costs in? Uh, blah, blah. That's right, you wouldn't. So we would expect those rates to tend to be less than an, than an off-site rate, the on-site versus the off-site. And I will just show you quickly how those rates were incorporated in a multi-year, multi-clin proposal, but very, very straightforward. You get some ideas there on putting together your CLINs and your proposals. So what you might see is, remember, this company is in Florida, and they're hiring basically the same types of people that um, they're hiring the same types of people that would be um, in their headquarters and in their local overhead in Florida as they would in Maryland. So you would expect the fringe rate to be the same. I and they, when they did their computations, they didn't really, they didn't feel that their GNA rate would alt, would go up or down. They feel like every year, again, their GNA rate was kind of a little bit high, but it seems to be the same every year. They were a unique uh, contractor that in this situation, again, the names were changed and numbers were changed to protect the innocent, but they were like forced that they couldn't put GNA even on other direct costs, which is a very odd thing, but they somehow got talked into that. They didn't have you advising them, Paul. So they got into a mess there. So we're going to kind of go through these things and see how it's built up. All right, let's go into the furniture first, or furnishings. And you can see there's a lot of detail here. They put a lot of things, tables, chairs, receptionist desks, all kinds of things, workstations. Their capitalization policy <clears throat> was if it's a unit price of 2000 or less, then it's not capitalized. So if it's greater than 2000 it's capitalized. But at the unit price, and you say, why a unit? Because there are mass purchases here. This is probably all purchased together. But So it didn't matter. Like, let's see if we see something else. Like here. If you go down to 17 G20 task chairs, okay? They're 554, but notice the total amount was 9431. It's not capitalized because they're doing it at the unit cost base. So in the cost accounting standards disclosure statement, which many of you may or may not deal with, when it gets to depreciation, it says, is it a mass purchase, a group purchase, or you do it on a unit basis? So they do it on a unit basis. So only two items become capitalized, and that's the clusters of these workstations because they cost $3,300. And you'll see down below, and that's why I put capitalized by it so I wouldn't forget. And uh IP centric system, whatever that is. I guess a server or something like that could it be quite possibly. Fourteen grand. Nice so, server. Yeah, nice server. Powerful. So they would capitalize that. But all the other items were non capitalized. So when you have these things you gotta kinda of build into your spreadsheet, you know, what's gonna go one way, capitalized, what's gonna go the other way, non capitalized. And because these were such big things, this is almost like a material items in a proposal, except it's just going into overhead. And the overhead's going into is the off-site overhead. And because they want it separate from their regular overhead in, in Florida, so they're going to put it in a different, they're going to set up their own. They have to for this location. And at the very bottom, The total value of the equipment was 118,000 roughly. The amount that was non-capitalized was 64, the items that were capitalized were 53, the capitalized generally furniture is over seven years straight line is a common thing. I'm not gonna get into the 179 uh, section of IRS. This is just for book purposes. 
So 53 divided by seven years is 7696 per year, and you'll see that in a minute. Because this was such a big thing, the furnishings, we had to make a separate analysis of that. The others were guesses. These were a little bit more precise. So let's go to the overhead rate that is off-site. And yet, notice, we haven't yet taken these rates and put them into a proposal on these other tabs. We're just now. So there's so many software engineers, hardware engineers, and so forth. They figured that all out. The standard applied over um, fringe rate is 36%. So they're using the same because the types of people going in here, they feel, are pretty much the same. So that's where this piece is. Okay, their base for projection is this, direct labor plus fringe benefits. To simplify it, we didn't include BNP. We didn't want to complicate things. But that could be in here, too. So this is a simplified overhead base, fringe, labor, total. Okay? Now they have an overhead pool, too. They have some overhead. Uh, no, they didn't. <laughs> There's no overhead in there. As I look at it, excuse me. If there was, it would be at 36%. So this overhead pool just has the things like rent. It has the furniture and fixed and equipment under 2000 so it's all 64, 234, there it is. But then the capitalized is 7696, and that's the yearly depreciation. So one of the questions that come up, and it's a seven-year, this is a three-year base and, and two, option one and two, so three-year effort. Well, can't we just put all the depreciation, you know, even though it's seven years, can't we just depreciate it? in the three years, and the government does not like that. So right. the contractor is taking on some risk, meaning that if they don't get the follow-on contract or something else, they're going to wind up selling this stuff. In all likelihood, yeah, and then they'll have a recapture, but that's another matter. But yeah. And typically, you know, I mean, unless they've changed the rules, uh, the, the, the uh, server that we uh, referenced earlier, that, that's a five-year, you know, as a five year. In fact, uh, if in fact the uh, value of the asset per even in aggregate mm -hmm. is $2,500 mm -hmm. or less, mm -hmm. then you just expense it. Of course, that was at $64,000 there. Right. You know, but uh, I guess my question is why would we use seven years? Is that something that the DCAA would want you to use to depreciate assets, or is that something that. Uh, well, maybe they just. Uh, didn't have many, and they just threw everything. They may have had just one category. You're right. Typically, uh, a server would only last five, maybe even less. Yeah. But maybe they three. just combined everything yeah. into seven. Yeah. So they could have gotten a little bit higher cost recovery in those three years if they broke out the server by itself. That's yeah. a good point. Yeah. I think the only thing that, in fact, it was changed in the new tax law, uh, you know, uh, leasehold improvements used to mm -hmm. go out 30 plus years and right? reduce the. That down, so I, I would imagine that along those lines, and I'm not 100% boned up on all the different uh, c categories of assets for depreciation, mm -hmm. but seven years is uh, I couldn't imagine how DCA would have any problem with that. In fact, they'd probably give you a pat on the shoulder. Yeah, good going. yeah good, going. good going. Yeah, good going. Good going. You're covering less costs over the length of the. That makes conference. my heart smile. Exactly. Okay. Now, good points. Yes, and they didn't put any leasehold improvements in here, but there could have been too. Some of that in here too because you go in a building there are a few things that will change but not in the on-site overhead because it's not going to do a facility so it's some good discussions there of other things and in fact when you're doing this and some of you who may have worked with pricing or work with the pricing folks that's one of the things you kind of go over did we consider everything you know we're we missing something like well, maybe we have a leasehold improvement or maybe we have to put in a classified skiff yeah. which under itself is very expensive so there are a lot of things to think about, and we just this is again a model which you can alter yourself. So you notice that in the three years, the base didn't change much here in this example, but what happened was was that um, the pool was higher in the first year because of the non-capitalized 
office furnishings and equipment. And then in the last two years, they don't exist, so the rate goes down. So 34, 44, then a 25, 91 in the two out years. And but many contractors do have to deal with the fact that depreciation um, goes beyond the contract life, and a lot of people get really, really concerned about that. How are they going to recover? Excuse me. There we go. So now let's go to the on-site rate. Now we're at the building itself. We're on NSA's territory, and they have a couple of people. Um, in fact, here they got some people. I don't know if they're coming up to NSA or Fort Detrick, but we're just pretending like they're all going to be at it. We're going to pretend that they're all at NSA just for the sake of doing it. Or wherever they would be, if they go to these different places, they're going to be on site. They're not going to be at an office building because they demand them to be on site. So notice again, we use the same overhead. Okay. Excuse me, the same fringe rate of 36% on the direct labor because the overhead rate is still the same mechanism. It is direct labor plus applied fringe, 575, 960. Now notice their overhead pool. They do have someone managing it. And so their overhead labor, in fact, they could be at the uh, offsite office location. And so some either one or two or, you know, it could be a combination of people. Assistant could be an assistant to a VP. They're not charging all their time here. It's just some of their time. Same fringe rate of 36% because it's the same fringe rate throughout the organization plus a small amount of supplies and travel uh, that's of an indirect nature. And they come up with 17.50. So these are how the two rates were developed. It's just a matter of doing it from scratch they knew from the proposal what their labor would have to be. And then it was a matter of, I guess, the accounting folks or someone, whoever, getting in there and saying, you'll need this, you'll need that, and this is the pool. So one thing that's very important, I noticed that when we put the proposal together, no one said anything came out of tech technical or operations. But actually, there'll be a technical volume and a cost volume. And on units, like labor hours, or number of bodies, they got to be the same. And that's something that always has to correlate together. You should do a quick check. Yeah, so you don't have a mismatch between what you're proposing is from a cost standpoint and what you're actually proposing from a technical standpoint. Yeah. They'll probably just throw it right out. Oh, they would. They'd say it was uh, technically not acceptable. Right. So now we take these rates that were here, like in the base year, the first year, of 3444 for the office offsite rate and the on site at the government site of 1750. And we incorporate it in our cost proposal. Notice up here, their CLINs. Fortunately, the CLIN equals the year. So they made it very simple. Sometimes the CLINs equal the labor category and they get very complicated. But the CLIN and the year equal the same. And they have two option years, and then they have a grand total for these CLINs. And so you can see, this is the headquarters folks. In other words, the headquarters folks are still going to do some direct labor on this project. And they're going to use the headquarters fringe rate of 36%. The rate that they had developed over the years, or the last current year, that they projected is 27% for their overhead. Okay? Now we go down to, this is how you do it. In other words, you got to line up the labor with the cost center or the overhead. How do you do it in your system? Do you guys call it cost centers that are ultimately yeah, overheads? Co cost centers are divisions, department, work group, geographic location. So in this case, uh, geographic location would apply that would be a cost center. For which you would accumulate. Which you'd accumulate, you take uh, basically the um, uh, general ledger accounts that are associated with that cost center, you know, your revenue and expense accounts. But as far as calculating your indirect rates, you do it by cost center account combination. Cool. Yeah, that's when you're defining your pools and your base. So in this case, you'd have a Florida cost center and you'd have a Maryland cost center. And um, you'd accumulate costs as such in, uh, when you're creating, when you're um, 
not only just are you, when you're pulling your costs, but when you're um, uh, direct charging the contract as well. There's going to be a cost under an account combination that's specific to that contract. Right. So then, um, would you ideally assign people like the Maryland offsite to the Maryland cost center, mm -hmm. their direct labor versus the direct labor of Florida yes. people charging? Yes. Yes. Exactly. Exactly. And then there's something called cross charging. How do you guys deal with that? Well, if there's a need to cross charge, basically that's going to be a timesheet entry. If you're talking about borrowed labor. No. I don't know. Well, cross charging to me it is because effectively you've got one person in one cost center charging a, con a, a, a contract that exists in a different cost center. So that's how I see it. But effectively that's going to be how the timesheet's recorded. When you're setting up the actual labor defaults, you're defining the cost center. So if somebody charges to that, it knows to uh, charge the labor to the right cost objective. So does that mean, as I would ask you a question because you said it in very technical language, um, just to bring it down basic for me. So say someone in Florida, mm -hmm. he's direct labor or she, and she now charges, let me finish, um, just so I can say the whole thing. They charge the Maryland offsite office, okay? They bring with them on that contract their overhead from Florida, Correct. right? That's right. And that's, that's to avoid total confusion. Correct. <laughs> You got it. Okay. Though so you call it borrowed labor. Well, you can call it what you want. You're cross charging, it's borrowed labor. From one group to another, but Correct. it always their overhead always follows them. Follows them, yes. Right. And that's that's one of the nice things of more sophisticated software. Right. Well, you do that. You know, again, if you have multiple overheads, then it's a useful feature if you have that scenario where you're uh, again to use my term borrowing labor from a different cost center or division department or work group. Okay. There you go. Okay. So, and you can see down here now that in the proposal, the Maryland site, the off-site, it has a bunch of labor, um, different types of folks, the fringe, which we talked about, and that I believe is the same base, the 753 for the base year, is the same base, yeah, 753.178. So it's nice when things kind of tie together. I always feel good about that. And then the 3444, remember it's a little bit higher in the first year because of the non-capitalized office furnishings. And we go down, and this is the way I put it together and organize it. And now we have the government site, the on-site. And you can see those folks too, 423500. And yes, 423500 in their buildup of the rate. So they're kind of like talking to each other. They're on the same page, the 1750. And then what this does is this totals all the labor, all the fringe, and all the overheads, which is the same, which is nice, is to do it in a matrix form. Notice in this column, this is a super secret that I'm sharing. Maybe I shouldn't share it. But the super secret way to do it is put things in buckets, like here's all the labor, Here's all the fringe, and here's the overhead cost for first for the Florida, then the Maryland off-site, then the Maryland on-site. And these two numbers here, whether you're going down this column or you're going across, they equal each other. Then we apply a very high GNA because in this scenario, uh, they're not allowed to apply it like on subcontractors for sure. Then we have the subcontractor with no application of any burden, because that's the way they proposed it, the grand total, the 8%, and the first year cost. And this, I just went as far as cost and stop. I didn't add the others. But. So you can see that they, and they kind of double check each other, because as accountants, or the pricing people, or the contracts people, we got to make sure it's done right. And option one, the only thing you're going to see that's different is that they did increase the labor. So there's a, you can see it in the formula, a 3% increase, a 3% increase, and so forth. Now the rate for the second year rate is 25.91 because it's just depreciated uh, office furnishings, nothing else. And we have the same applied government site rate. 
and the entity feels that the GNA and the fringe won't change much. And sometimes G, uh, DCA in your proposals, they don't seem to be bothered by the straight lining of certain rates as long as in the, the main year you're proposing you've got detail. But I've seen it where they would submit flash estimating reports. Well, when I worked for DCA, they did. They said, you know, your out year rates aren't, aren't projected. But well, I was going to ask, you said uh, flash rates. What do you mean? Uh, they called them a flash report, like it's going to go out right away. The report is going out instantly. You know, it won't be a long report. It'll be a one page or two pages because some of their reports they get into 15, 20 pages, which takes a while. Yeah. Just to let everybody know, every contracting officer you have, and you know, know that hey, they think you're not doing it right. Well, thank you for expounding upon that. But yeah, I think if I was a contractor, I could make the argument if, my, if I have a flat organization, then my projections are going to be uh, the same as they were the year before, and presumably the year before that. So you'd be talking to the contracting officer about that, or to DCA if they discuss right. it. Remember, on on price or cost proposals, DCA will not disclose their their assessments or their judgments of things because they feel that that's for negotiation purposes. And also they're a little bit, you know, they don't have to confront you on this. Right. So it's not a bad idea. You cannot request from DCA through FOIA, you know, the Freedom of Information Act, yeah. but you can do the contracting officer once everything is oh, yeah. settled. Absolutely. And it's not a bad idea to get a copy of these reports or any reports um, like this, just to see what they said about you so you have a better understanding how DCA views you, how they interpreted things. And so the grand total of everything is all I did was, oh, this is special. Um, I just have total headquarters. I don't need anything else. It's just a grand total of the three years, as you can see in the formula up here, option two, option one base, and the fringe and the overhead. And I do the same for the Maryland site, and I do it for the on-site. Now, notice something here. These are the grand totals, total labor, total fringe, total overhead, and so forth. I can actually do formulas. In other words, since the fringe is the same, I can take the grand total of the fringe, divide it by the total labor, and as a check, yep, everything was at 36%. I can do that for the headquarters overhead, E and C. I think it's back up here somewhere. Uh, keep going, Paul. Yeah, E and C. E and C. So E over C plus D. And I can check that overhead, too. And that's nice. Yeah, there it is. And then G and A, I can check for all of it. So that's H and G. I can divide this by this number, the G and A pool by the base. And then I can also do the profit if I wanted to over the total cost. These are just mechanisms. Also, the on-site rate I can do as well. I think I put numbers. So the on-site rate is 1, 2, and 3. And I'm going to 3 over 1 plus 2. The one I cannot do at the end is because the offsite rate changed from 344 to 2591 to 2591. I can't do it for that. But there, it's kind of, I would say, cool, but it's nice to have self checking mechanisms within proposals to confirm your rates are on track with what you intended. This is a small one. Many of you, I'm sure, have dealt with multiple cleans over multiple periods and to have self checking items in there can help. Okay, let's go back to the PowerPoint. And this will be our last business scenario situation where we had most of the year, but not all of the year, and we're going to build from a pivot table. Okay, just before we get out of this section, we're just showing you again that we made copies for you. So even though we jumped to a spreadsheet, you have all of this information um, in our, in our um, PowerPoint so that you can understand. The only difference is it took two uh, slides to do a full year on the proposal, 
and then I do for option year one. I didn't do option year two, and then I did the grand total because it's almost the same approach. Okay, less than a full year of history, and we're going to use a pivot table to build an annual budget to compute our indirect rates. And so this is our final scenario. One of the things that's very important is we hope that at the end when we build um, an annual budget that we have certain reports that are helpful to DCA, such as labor distribution and indirect rates. These are kind of the very unique things that only a more sophisticated accounting system can do. A simple thing like an Intac or QuickBooks can do these uh, to direct costs and the indirect costs, but often don't have a mechanism. I know that some third-party applications with QuickBooks um, that can do a, an indirect rate connected. So it's just you pay and you get what you pay for. And uh, it's not like anything is wrong or right, but um, if it's fully integrated, you're able to do a lot more and do a lot more quicker. So we'll have a pivot table that will show these types of reports, I mean, these types of things, the labor distribution either by employee or by job, by period, uh, calculating the indirect rates, in this case, we're only dealing with a fringe and a GNA. We're just not getting into the overhead, only to save time and keep it simple. Um, we also want reports by general ledger and a job detail that shows the detailed labor and the detailed non-labor. In a pivot table, you can see it. It's not as pretty as some of the other reports, but you can see it. Okay, great. Thanks, Paul. So with that, we've come to our last polling question, which is, when are your projected indirect rates developed during a cost of price proposal in response to an RFP at the beginning of the new fiscal year as provisional billing rates? Is it updated quarterly, part of your forward pricing rate submission, or when requested by the government auditor or agency, or you just don't know? So please take a moment now to answer. While everybody's answering, I'll provide third and final CPE word. The third and final word is billing, B-I-L-L-I-N-G. Again, the final CPE word for today's webinar is billing, B-I-L-L-I-N-G. Well, this is interesting. During the cost proposal, 16%. It's nice, and DCA would pat everyone on the back that, uh, the back that would do it at the beginning of the year for the provision of billing rates. A few have more sophisticated um, systems or presentations to the government, the forward pricing rate submission, which is done quarterly. Um, and some, when requested by the government auditors, and a few don't know, but I think doing it at the beginning of the year is the best way, but what usually happens is it either is requested or during a price proposal. It's at the very beginning when you start developing these rates. Yeah, if you have a cost reimbursable uh, contract in your pipeline and it looks like we're going to win it, well, that would be an impetus to go ahead and start it at any time of year. But yeah. if going forward, yeah, you want to start at the beginning of your fiscal year because every fiscal year brings a new set of provisional rates. Yeah. And uh, But if I, I trust that there's probably some folks in the audience today that are kind of learning about this for the first time because all their work maybe is GSA schedule for a fixed price contract. Me too. This is just for their information if they decide to delve into that world of cost reimbursable work. Uh, if they try to pursue contracts, and that is the contract type. Exactly. Okay. All right, so we'll jump to the pivot table. And there we go. All right. So, if you haven't dealt much with pivot tables, they're super fun, and I mean it, I love dealing with them, but it does take forever to build them. And if you've got most of the data and you know that the rest of the year is predictable, um, what you do is you start with the way I did this. Now, remember, you can build a table with pivot any way you want. Sometimes you can get them from a labor dump, I mean, or some kind of dump from a computer and, and be data and then organize it. But generally, you got to do it in order, like L is labor, 
eventually you'll see non-labor. Then the general accounts, general ledger accounts are all in numeric order. Obviously, this is another one of those that I changed everything. The names have been changed to protect the innocent. So all I did was I just put in their, their initials. Um, but you want their name. And PID basically is like a job number. So And then you've got to show and build it out over the year. And notice this first individual is gone after three months, even though it's a budget. I can't underscore how important it is for you to develop an annual budget as a government contractor. It's, it's a discipline, and from that come the provisional rates. Whether you do it through a software thing, um, however, an Excel, without a pivot table, however you desire to do it. Um, and you can see in this case, actually what happened was the person didn't leave. What happened was they were on one thing, the Navy contract, and then in April they went to the Air Force contract. And so we go down in a similar fashion and we go to the non-labor. You'll notice that, hold on, let me get down here, L and NL, meaning non-labor, and then they go in, in, in a certain order and they're dealing with contractual things. Um, they keep going down. Jay-Z's in there. Hmm. Technical consultant, need a little bit of that. Um, and then some other vendors as well. And notice they're all identified with a particular effort, with a particular job number. So this entity has direct travel, supplies, equipment. They work with the web hosting and software as a service, some direct pricing and so forth and so on. So when you've done all that, you come up with this. You press a button. If you did it right, it comes out nice and neat. And what you're seeing here actually is um, employee and what they charge, what you anticipate them charging over the year. So let me go down to one that has a few charges here. Most of them, it looks like in this example, well, few were one. Here, GJ. No, it's a GH. So this is Gary, and Gary worked on 241, 405, and 242. And you can see in what months and what he was scheduled in the end, he works on 405 and 242. Earlier in the year, he worked on 241, so he migrated over to the, the bridge co uh, contract towards the end of the year. But basically, in more sophisticated ones, they can even show paid absence and when they're charging that. Um, and if they should charge any indirect. There is one person, let me see where she is, that charges uh, Michelle. Yeah, see here, Michelle charges 241, 405, but also a little bit to GNA. So it's a small group, it's only 20 plus kind of people, so many people wearing different hats. Most all of them charge direct, and a few, like Michelle, charges indirect because she's responsible for the organization. In developing the fringe rate, once you get all this data organized, what I do is I say, okay, this is all the labor, so I total it in this column. This happens to be a fringe item, severance. It's just sitting up there. This is sorted by uh, internal accounts, so that's why this is kind of off. And then I just go down, and everything that's labor goes in column P. Everything that's related to fringe, which we'll hit in a minute, uh, goes into the fringe pool. And we'll get to it in a minute. I hope. Here we go. First one is 93000 which is group insurance. Then we get a little bit of payroll processing fees and payroll taxes. There's not a lot of benefits with this entity. A workman's, workman's a workers' comp. And then you can see the total of Q fringe pull is here as 251. The total of the labor base is 1873, and they have a very low fringe rate of 1341. So extremely low, but nevertheless, that's what it is. And then here's the labor distribution, which sorts from the pivot table 
and you can see here, so this is 241, the Navy contract. These are all the people, including Jay-Z, that work on this and their totals. So I can see for the year or for a particular month, apparently they stopped in the last quarter and they moved to a different contract. But you can see here exactly month by month by month what the people charged under the Navy or under the bridge contract. And you can see they picked up right where the other one left off. Here's just a straightforward one by GL account. So here's their payroll. And then all of the other accounts, just GL account order. And you know that when you deal with the government orders, they want to see GL account. They don't just want to see the title. It's kind of frinky dink. That's how they were schooled. Exactly. This is sorted by the summary of these contracts and indirect GNA and fringe benefits. And so basically, the whole cost for that year is $3.363 million. And so basically, we are able to figure out what the base is for GNA 3.1, 203 over 3.1 is a very low rate of 6.45%. And again, we just we're just putting uh, I think in whatever column. Let me see how this works. P5, P5. So everything was already put into the GNA pool. So all I have to do is go over here and say, um, and then I added the fringe on GNA labor and pulled it out of fringe. So it's a very simple 203 and then over the base. So it's, it's not like rocket science. And the last one before we start to move to um, our questions in a minute, but we'll show you is just a detail this is a detail of 242 Navy contract, and L is the labor, and N is the non-labor. This is just using a pivot table. When you have a nice software system like Simpact, then you have you know nice reports that put it all on one page. Or you can is... just uh, query the database. We use pivot tables all the time. We oh, use, really? We pivot data. Yeah, absolutely. To get uh, the reports. Uh, to get data that may not be uh, formatted on the report in such a manner. You know, Excel is a wonderful tool. And, and then, it, so then it gets we, flipped into the report? It actually gets flipped into the report. You know, I won't go into the technical details, no, but want. effectively, uh, you know, the, uh, the, the, the you have the capability of uh, linking a spreadsheet to the SQL database and uh, using pivot tables to pivot data out of it as such. Cool. So they're used in, in all respects. Okay, if we can go to the PowerPoint. PowerPoint, yeah. Uh, back uh, when Microsoft released Office uh, 2010, uh, that's where Power Pivot came into being. It's mm -hmm. actually a very nice tool. Uh, For Excel? Yeah, yeah. It's a little add on. You know, actually, it was an add on up until I believe uh, Excel 2013, but any uh, 2016, for example, it's already built in. Power Pivot, you don't have to download it any longer. And what does Power Pivot do? It just basically uh, helps in terms of uh, slicing. It's got data slicers in it. Right, it's got slicing. a lot. Of, it's got got a lot of uh, capability that the traditional power, uh, pivot tables up until that point did not have. So I it see. goes a lot further in terms of what you can do with it, analyzing data. Oh, cool. Yeah. And this, before we get to the questions, just again, for your uh, knowledge and for your to look back at this pivot table, we put copies, of parts of these, um, in these slides of the entry table, of the labor distribution by employee, so you could see how it's set up. The labor distribution by job, um, GL expense accounts, and how that would look, and then a job labor and non-labor detail from the pivot table, just so that you could see um, how we computed the fringe rate, the GNA rate, and this is what um, uh, Chris was talking about, this is Slicer here. Yeah. You can click on one of them and they would give you different results. And they also got one for time. Excellent, thanks guys. So before we wrap up today, we wanna to answer some of the questions submitted by our online participants and anybody else from the room. 
Obviously, if you have any additional questions after today's webinar, please reach out to us. Our contact information is listed on this slide. So with that, Chris, um, you might have already touched upon this, but can you just briefly describe the difference between a forward and projected rate and a provisional rate? Uh, yes, they're one and the same. Uh, I don't know if Paul is in 100% agreement with that, but effectively your provisional rate, as I mentioned, is your temporary, your interim, your uh, non-permanent rate, and it's based on a projection. It's based on a budget. So those words are used interchangeably. Yeah, absolutely. So we okay. call it forward it. pricing. Not to be confused with a forward pricing rate agreement, which is another animal unto itself that involves more than just direct rates, more than indirect rates, I should say. Okay, got it. And Paul, what would you say is a recommended timeline for getting started on preparing these forward rates for, let's say, a calendar year contractor? How long could or should this calculation of the forward rate take for a contractor with a pretty simple three-tiered rate structure? You know, this, that, this person's question is a really good question, and they are important. And first of all, the reason why having provisional billing rates developed is because at some point during the year, if you have a CPFF contract, they're going to test your voucher, but then they're going to ask for your did we, if we didn't do a PBR, you know, a provisional billing rate review, do you have your provisional billing rates? And well, you better get them together because they won't pay that voucher until they got that. So the recommended timeline obviously would be as soon as you can. It's nice to have the year end numbers, you know, um, and be able to do stuff. And I don't think DC would do too many flips and flops if you gave it to them in early February or something like that with the advantage of having a full year because full year data just gives you something you really need. That's the way the rates are really set up. Um, and even if you disclose that to them in your policy and procedure and just said our policy is we want to get the indirect, you know, even if uh, it's not exact, if you're audited, even if you're not audited, it's not complete, just to have a full year. Um, so that would be ideal by sometime in February. Um, today is the 20th and you had them by now, that would make DSA very, very, feel very comfortable. Um, for example, um, there's an entity that I work with that's in the West Coast, and I was talking with the auditor just because I had her on the phone. And I thought, why not ask her? I said, uh, uh, when do you guys, or is there a certain time of the year you could provisional billing rates? says, yes, we expect them in hopefully by, you know, sometime in March at the latest. And then we will go through all of them and kind of, you know, see whether or not we need to ask more questions. And then you said, how long perhaps would the calculation or exercise take? Um, but even for a simplified one, sometimes 40 hours, if you really want to do it and it has some meat to it. Um, it does, even with my skill set, it still takes time. I don't know what you think. I, I would agree with you, yeah. There's a lot of thought that goes into it. Um, and if you're building it from scratch, it could take longer. Right. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And Paul, somewhat of a follow-on question: How important is it to have your budget finalized for the next fiscal year before you get working on these forward and projected rates? Again, an excellent uh, question. That person's pretty intuitive that asked that question because it all does go together. You really can't do anything unless you have an annual budget. And working in Gelman and Rosenberg Freeman, the thing I've learned is because I not only work with GovCons but also nonprofits, is nonprofits are mandatorily required, I guess, to have an annual budget. And it is a great discipline for a government contractor to have one too. So they can see what's really going to happen over the full year. And then, like you saw on the pivot table, break it down by month. Because people come and go, or you might say, I don't know who's going, but I know this person's not coming till the middle of the year. So, you know, it just, it helps an awful lot. And it's it's just so extremely important to have this so that we can, from that, create our projected rate. Got it. Thanks, Paul. And finally, Chris, one question for you. So how important do you think it is to compare your forward and projected rates to your, you know, 
actual rates should should this information on any variances between the actual and the forward or projected be used in developing future years forward rates? That's a great question. Um, the first part of it is how important is it to compare your uh, your projected indirect rates, your provisional rates, if you will, to your actuals. Very important. Uh, I mentioned earlier, you may be in a situation where you're overspent on your rates, and it could be that if you are, you can make a uh, an adjustment. You can do uh, you re request a retroactive rate agreement uh, that would enable you to when you're over or underspent on your indirect rates to go back and, and, and recast them from the start of the year and apply them to your billing so that you get them at least more in line with how you're actually incurring uh, those costs. And uh, one thing that a lot of contractors don't realize, if they don't monitor their provisional rates, their projected rates with their actual rates, you could be underspent on your rates, which means effectively you're billing, you're overbilling the government because you've got a provisional rate of X and you're incurring at Y and effectively, what's happening there is because you're not recovering all of your costs that are reflected in your provisional rates, or you're not you're not charging at the same uh, level, you're going to owe money at the end of the contract, as opposed to being able to make a claim at the end of the contract, an equitable claims adjustment. So, very important. And is it important for using a, uh, in the use of a future years forward rates? Indeed, it is, because I'll have some more data to put on that plot line. I'll have some more data that I can say, yeah. We, 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 in this year just completed, uh, or is nearing completion, we're, we're running at this particular uh, level of uh, fringe overhead G&A facilities, whatever your indirect rate structure uh, entails. And, uh, yeah, having that data there helps a lot for uh, future projections. Excellent. Okay. No, that makes sense. Thanks for clarifying. Okay, well, with that, GRF would like to thank everybody for attending today's webinar. As always, we encourage you to check our website for any upcoming events and updates at www.grfcpa.com slash resources slash webinars. And again, please remember to complete the emailed survey that follows if you'd like to earn CPE credit for today's webinar. Thanks again for attending and have a great day. Thank you.